and uh, lift our voices and our hearts to you. And, and we, we're hungry to learn from you today. So come, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Great, okay. Um, if, you, if you've got a Bible, I hope you've all brought a Bible. Uh, in the old days, that used to sheep, sort out the sheep from the goats. Uh, or if you've got it on an iPhone, key thing is to look at it. So if you'd like to turn in your Bibles, if you haven't got one, can you look over the next door, your next door neighbours? And we're going to be looking at a passage in Exodus 4. So if you'd like to turn to Exodus 4, uh, verses 1 to 17. Now I want to just introduce uh, the subject before we uh, get Gina to re read to us. Um, Last night, we were talking about the, the, the overall theme of the weekend is sharing the love of Jesus Christ. We want to share the love of Jesus Christ with us. And it's lovely to hear your testimonies this morning with our friends, with our uh, hairdressers, with our, the people who we meet at the gym or wherever. Uh, wherever we meet other people, and uh, we, want to, we want to share the love of Jesus Christ with them. And... Um, uh, so just, just to start us off with a story, I, I like to collect these stories, and I think I've got the wrong, oh no, I've got the right one, that's good. So this is the, a letter from a, a girl, um, she's writing back to her mum and dad, she's just started at university, she's in her first year at university, and she's trying to gain sympathy, and she wants to give a new perspective on things, it's very important when we're thinking about out sharing the love of Jesus Christ, that we have a, the right perspective on this, and we don't we don't want to work ourselves up into a, a, a you know some kind of wrong thinking about this. So she writes, "Dear Mum and Dad, since I left for university, I've been remiss in writing, and I'm sorry for my thoughtlessness in not having written before. I'll bring you up to date now, but before you read on, please sit down. Are you sitting down? Don't read on unless you are." I'm getting along pretty well now, the skull fracture and uh, concussion that I got when I jumped out of my dormitory window when it caught on fire shortly after my arrival here has pretty well healed. I only get those sick headaches once a day. Fortunately, the fire in my room and the jump was witnessed by an attendant at the petrol station. He ran over, took me to hospital and continued to visit me there. When I got out of the hospital, I had nowhere to live because of the burnt out conditions of my room, so he was kind enough to invite me to share his basement bedroom flat with him. It's sort of small but cute. He's a very fine boy and we have fallen deeply in love and are planning to get married. We haven't set the exact date yet, but it will be before my pregnancy begins to show. <laughs> yes, mum and dad, I'm pregnant. I know how much you're looking forward to being grandparents and I know you will welcome the baby and give it the same tender care and devotion that you gave me when I was a child. The reason for the delay in our marriage is that my boyfriend has a minor infection which I carelessly caught from him. I know, however, that you will welcome him into our family with open arms. He is kind and although not well educated, he is ambitious. Although he's of a different race and religion than ours, I know that your often expressed tolerance will not permit you to be bothered by that. In conclusion, now that I have brought you up to date, I want to tell you that there was no fire in my bedroom. I did not have concussion or skull fracture. I was not in the hospital. I'm not pregnant. I'm not infected. And there is no boyfriend in my life. However, I am failing history and science. <laughs> and I, I wanted you to see these marks in their proper perspective. <laughs> so it's very important that we get the right perspective on things. And um, so we're going to look at one man. We're going to look at different people each at the, at the, at the sessions. I want us to look at Moses this morning and we'll look at Paul after coffee. And... Um, I want us to think about Moses, um, and so I've got Gina, she could read. So if you can follow this, it's Exodus chapter 4, 
verses 1 to 7. Now, it's really important that you've got the text open in front of you because we're going to look at the text together. Fire away. So we've got a... There we are. Yeah, that's it, that's it. So the reading that we've had is Exodus chapter 4, starting at verse 1 to 17. And it's the signs for Moses. Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of the fathers, God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, Put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was leprous, like snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first miraculous sign, they may believe the second, but if they do not believe these, sorry, the two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And the Lord said to him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, Oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. (laughs) Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother, Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you to speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if it were your mouth and as if it were your God to him. But take this staff in your hand so that you can perform miraculous signs with it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm sure you know the background to the story. If you just turn back to chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, the Israelites, God's people, were in Egypt and they were suffering. They were under this cruel pharaoh. If you look at verse 22, they groaned in their slavery and they cried out. And their cry for help, because of their slavery, went up to God. And God heard their groaning, and he remembered the covenant that he'd made with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites, and he was concerned about them. And God begins to act, and he acts in an an extraordinary way. He calls this man, Moses, who's out in the Sinai desert, working as a shepherd for his father-in-law, and he begins to uh, call and reveal himself to Moses because he wants Moses to lead the people God's going to deliver the people he he wants him to lead the people from their slavery to the promised land and the story of the exodus is all about that amazing deliverance that God uh, did now I think this is a very good picture of salvation and the work of mission which God calls us all to be involved in Uh, Because uh, one of the best words for 
salvation is the word freedom. When God offers salvation to people, he wants to set them free. He wants people to be free. And one of the things that people struggle with is enslavement, bondage. People are enslaved. Before I was a Christian, I was enslaved by many things. And uh, I still struggle. I mean, I'm not, I've got a lot, you just talk to my wife, she'll tell you. Um, uh, there are still many issues that I'm struggling with as a Christian. But when I came to Christ, he set me free. Free from things that were destructive, uh, in my life and also he set me free to be all that God had made me to be and God has made you he's given you great every one of you has great potential this church has enormous potential it's very interesting coming in from outside and just as I'm getting to know some of you there's fantastic experience and gifts here in this church and God wants to use us he wants to use you as an individual, but also he wants to use us as a church to be involved with him in setting the people of Shipley free. He wants to set people free. He loves people and he wants to set them free. And he calls us as his people to be involved with him in the task of setting people free. And that's the task of evangelism and mission which is sharing the love of Jesus Christ. But you know, as well as I do, and we've already heard from our testimony this morning, we all struggle with that. All of us struggle. None of us find this easy. Would be easy if it was easy, but it's not easy. It's hard. And uh, we struggle with this, uh, all of us. And we struggle as a church. We're struggling with this. There's a huge battle going on for our, the soul of our nation. And we are struggling in this task of declaring the love of Jesus Christ into our society and into our culture. And that's what I want to be thinking about with you this weekend. And just think of, I mean, I was absolutely staggered to read about this. And I saw the headline, Woman Stabs Herself to Death. And it was in Shipley. I couldn't believe it. I thought, golly, I'm going, well, I know we're in the lakes, but... That, just think of the pain that woman must have been in, terrible pain. And many of the people that you know in your streets, my wife and I have moved very recently from the vicarage we were living in, because the vicarage went, unfortunately for me, with the job that I had at St. Mike's. So we had to move, we moved into a tiny little house round the corner on an estate in the parish in Coronation Street where my wife's the vicar and... Um, and the night we moved in, and this is a sort of, you know, it's, it's not a rough estate that people aren't drug dealing and it's just a, it's kind of just a, a modern development uh, uh, behind the station. The night we moved into the estate, somebody was murdered round the corner, a hundred yards from where we lived. And people aren't murdered a lot in York and they're never murdered on that estate. A soldier murdered his girlfriend because of some, I don't know what was going on. So the next morning, I got up really early and the next morning, the television cameras, the, they were all there, a hundred yards from where we live. And uh, my wife and I went out, she'd just come back from the gym, she put a dog collar on, she was quoted in the mail and the express. All this is going on behind closed doors. You don't know what's going on behind closed doors in your street. Terrible things are happening, uh, and, and we don't know it. And then something terrible happens, and we suddenly realize the, the pain, the pain that people are living in, in our society. And God wants you and I to be involved with him in sharing this good... I hope, I hope you long for that. I hope you long for that. If you don't long for that, what are you doing in your Christian life? If that's not on your heart... You need to go to God and ask him to give you a soft heart because he's got a heart for these people that you and I are in touch with. Now, when he calls us to do this, we come up with excuses, all of us. And it doesn't matter what we're like, whether we're extroverted or introverted, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be an extrovert to do this stuff. You just have to have a heart for God. If you have a heart for God and a heart for people, God will use anyone. He'll use anybody, as I'm going to show 
uh, from this story. And, um, and usually, my experience is that when God calls his people and he wants us to be involved, we come up with various excuses. And they're very similar to the excuses that Moses made. So ha let's go back to the story and let's have a look at the excuses that Moses makes when God calls him to be involved in this task of leading the people from slavery to the promised land. So let's have a look. Now have a look at your text. First excuse comes in verse 1. If we could go on to the next. Uh, the first excuse is they will never believe me. Look at verse 1. Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? So the first excuse and I have to say I've got great sympathy with Moses at this point they'll never believe me when I go back to Egypt and I'll say God has appeared to me in a in a burning bush and he's told me to lead you all from your slavery into this promised land that God's going to lead you to they're not going to believe me and uh, we all have that experience don't we when we talk to people and just the look of sheer unbelief. I talk to people all the time and I'm often met with sheer unbelief in people's faces. And, uh, and I struggle with unbelief myself. Now I want you to notice how God answers this excuse. What does God do first of all? He says to Moses, what have you got in your hand? Now what did Moses have in his hand? A staff. He had a shepherd's staff because he was a shepherd. And uh, God says to Moses, and I'm sure it was a real staff. Don't think this was a make believe. This is not a spiritual metaphor. It was a real staff. And then God says to Moses, What does he tell him to do? Throw the staff or the crook on the ground. Now, I'm sure Moses did that. He threw the crook on the ground. I'm going to talk a bit more about this as we go on. And what happened to the staff on the ground? It became a snake. Now, I am sure it became a snake. I think this was a real snake. This isn't a spiritual metaphor. If some commentaries say that this was a spiritual metaphor, how do you think Moses is going to lead over two million people through the desert from the most cruel leader? He'd have made Saddam Hussein look like a puppet a puppy, uh, with a spiritual metaphor in his hand. I mean, I ask you, bonkers, absolutely bonkers. So it, I'm sure it was a real snake. And it was a, probably a poisonous snake, because there are lots of these poisonous snakes, they live under the sand in the Sinai. And what does God then tell Moses to do? Yeah, he tells him to pick the snake, the poisonous snake, up, by the tail. Now, when did you last, last pick a poisonous snake up? By the tail. Have you ever picked a... Maybe you've picked a poisonous snake. Has anybody picked a poisonous snake? Oh, that's interesting. Where did you do that, sir? In South Africa. Okay, well, most of us haven't had this experience of picking a... Is it, was it frightening? A bit frightening. Yeah, I'd have been frightened. Anyway, I think Moses was frightened because he actually ran. If you look, he ran from the... He ran from the snake, tells us there in the text. So Moses picks the snake up, and what happens to the snake? It becomes a crook again in his hand. Now, I'm sure that all happened. So God gave him the first sign. That was his first sign. Here's a sign for you to show the people and to show Moses that he was with him. Okay, now what's this? And he said... Uh, so that they will believe in you. And then he said, he gives him a second sign. And what's the second sign? He's told to put his hand into his cloak. So he puts his hand into his cloak. He pulls his hand out. And what's his hand covered in? Leprosy. Uh, if you want a modern day equivalent, he had AIDS. He was going to die. Well, I know that's changing now, but basically it was death. So his hand is covered. I mean, imagine the total paralysis, the fear of that in Moses' heart when he saw that. And then God says what to him? Put your hand back into your cloak, which he does. 
and he pulls it out and what's happened to it? God's restored it. So God was showing Moses and would show the people that he had power over death. It's very important. And then the third sign, if they don't believe these signs, what's Moses, to, what's he got to do? He's got to take some water from the Nile, the Nile River. Probably some of us here have seen the Nile. I've been down the Nile and, yeah. Um, you, the, and the Nile was a god to the Egyptians. They worshipped the Nile. And then he's got to pour the water of the Nile onto the ground where it would become blood in which no life could live. In other words, God would show that he was more powerful than the Egyptian gods. Now, could we just open a door or two? Because I think, it, I mean, a window. Can anybody open Because I think we are going to get a bit hot. And I've only just started. So uh, that's it. It's great. So uh, would you all, are you all tired? Shall we just do this point and then you can all get up and move? Because we've had a big breakfast, haven't we? You okay? If you, if, you, if you are feeling a bit tired, and I can see that one or two of you are looking a bit tired, uh, I don't mind if you just get up and move around. That's absolutely fine. In fact, let's all do that. Come on, let's just get up. Move around. Breathe in. That's it. Is what? Wimby used to do that. Did it? Okay. Turn around. Turn around. Okay, all right then. Right. Now let's uh, move on, if you'd like to sit down again. Let's move on and let's look at Moses' second excuse. Now the second excuse comes in verse 11. Well, actually it's verse 10 and 11. M Moses says to the Lord, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. So the second excuse that Moses comes up with is, I'm no good at public speaking. Now, the Hebrew, I don't know Hebrew, but I know where to look it up. The Hebrew is very interesting. The Hebrew basically means that Moses suffered from a, sta a stammer or a stutter. Now, I don't know whether you know anybody who's got a stutter. I've got one or two friends who've got a stutter. And the thing that they most fear is speaking in public. Uh, in fact, I, I made a terrible faux pas on this. I got a young man who was um, in our congregation in Edinburgh, and I didn't realize he had a stutter. And I got him to read the scriptures in front of several hundred people, and it nearly killed him. But he did it. He did it. And I want you to imagine the sheer terror of giving uh, uh, directions to over two million people with a stutter. Try and imagine just the sheer, sheer agony of doing that. So um, Moses says to the Lord that I I'm no good at this. I can't speak publicly. Do you know what men in Britain fear most of all is public speaking. That came out as the thing that they most feared. And um, God says to Moses, how does God answer Moses? Look at verse 11. He says, who gave human being their mouths? Who made them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? In other words, Moses, you're like that because I made you like that. I'm going to come back to that. I made you. I created you like that. Uh, and then uh, he he uh, says, I will help you to speak and I will teach you what to say. So you can rely on me, I'll help you, don't worry. I'll to help, help you to do this. So that was excuse number two. Now, do you think that convinced Moses? No. So he comes up with excuse number three. And he's quite polite to God. Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send somebody else. Please don't ask me to do it. That came out beautifully as you read it for us. Please send somebody else. Please ask somebody else to do it. And we're told that the Lord's anger burnt against Moses. Now, we can just go on to the next slide. Uh, I did my curacy in this church. 
uh, which I mentioned last night at All Souls Langham Place with great, the great John Stott, so I was very privileged. He was, he was the rector emeritus then, and I worked with a chap called Michael Bourne, uh, Andrew Corn. some of you were talking to me about Andrew Corn. So I was with Andrew. And um, I was just beginning as a preacher, and uh, when you start preaching, uh, it's very nerve-wracking when you have to start preaching, and it's very, very nerve-wracking when you have to preach in front of John Stott, I can tell you. If you think <laughs> preaching is frightening, imagine preaching in front of one of the greatest preachers that we've had in this country since the Second World War. And um, I was asked to preach on Exodus 4, verses 1 to 17. And I'd also learnt another interesting thing earlier. I was only a young man, 26, 27. <coughs> I'd learnt that if uh, my wife and I were going to enjoy, we had these two little boys a day off on Saturday. We used to have Saturday as a day off then. I knew that I had to have the sermon in the bag by Friday afternoon, otherwise no day off, just tension and stress and worry. And so I had read every single commentary in the world as I could find on Exodus 4. I had looked, read it, I would studied it, I prayed, I, and I had no sermon and, uh, by Friday. And actually, I had no sermon by Saturday night. I mean, I could say something, but I didn't have a sermon. And, and what was worse, I checked the list, because usually John Stott was in South America or Asia or India. And to my absolute horror, I noticed he was going to be there. So I want you to imagine this young, terrified preacher, uh, very green, behind the ears. He's going to have to preach to a 1,000 people plus with John Stott behind him on Exodus 4. Try and imagine the gripping terror. Try and get into that. Feel what it must have felt like. So on Saturday night, I said to the Lord, Lord Jesus, you've got to help me. I've got to, pre he knew all this, he, uh, but uh, you, I've, got to pre I've got to preach this sermon to all these people tomorrow, and Lord John Stott is going to be there. Please, please, will you help me? Please give me something to say to the people tomorrow. So I went back to the text again for the 60th time, and I looked at it, and I noticed something very interesting in the text. Now, I wonder if you were preaching on this text and you looked at it. I wonder if you would see the thing that I saw in the text. And I'll give you a clue. It's in verse 14. <laughs> a clue. I'm actually giving you the answer. Well, I'm giving you the answer of what God said to me. As I looked at it, I noticed something very interesting. I noticed that only one of the excuses that Moses made, made God angry. Did you notice that? None of the other excuses make God angry. There's only one excuse which actually makes God angry. And I knew another thing, because I knew my Bible a little bit. I knew that God does not get angry easily. Actually, he's slow to anger. And if it says in the Bible that God's anger burnt against Moses, it's saying something very, very important. Because it wouldn't be there in the text if it wasn't important. Yeah? So I thought, I'm onto something. Am I? My blood was beginning to, and I thought, I've got, I've got a sermon here. There's a sermon. So I went back to the excuses, and I looked at them again, but with a different eye. And I want to share with you the sermon I preached that morning, which John Stock came up afterwards, and he put his arm around me, and he said, thank you, dear brother. So here's the sermon. Let's go back. And I want to ask the question, because we struggle with the same issues that Moses struggled with when it comes to us sharing the love of Jesus Christ with our friends, with our family, with our neighbours, uh, and with our parishes. So what was behind the excuses? So let's look at the first one, unbelief. Now I want you to go back to the first, they will never believe me. What was Moses actually saying? What was the excuse 
The real excuse, I believe, was unbelief. Now, the reason I think it was unbelief is if you look back at chapter 3 and verse 18, have you got that in front of you? What does God say to Moses? Yeah, he says, he's just appeared to Moses, and then he says to, to them, to Moses, the elders of Israel will listen to you. So God has just told Moses that the elders will listen to him. And what does Moses do? Verse 1, he turns that round and he says, what if they do not believe me or listen to me? Now, before we uh, jump on Moses and criticise him, we all do that. I do that all the time. God says one thing, and I say, no. Or you can't mean that, God. You can't possibly mean that. Yeah? I mean, I'll give, there are so many examples. I'll just give you one. Do not worry about tomorrow. Well, come on. Let's be honest with ourselves, with each other. Do we do that all the time? No, we don't. We we, we don't believe God. There are lots of things God says in his word which we struggle to believe. Now, and when it comes to this issue of reaching out with the love of Christ, we have exactly the same problems. So what I want you to do is notice how God answers the problem. How does God answer the problem of unbelief in Moses? Well, let's have a look. The thing that I noticed as I went through this is that God gives Moses something to do. And it's very simple. Throw your crook on the ground. Now, Moses could not have done anything there at that point. He could have disobeyed the Lord. But, and this is the important thing, he does what God tells him. So he throws the crook on the ground, and what happens to it? It becomes a snake. Now, God then asked Moses to do something more difficult. Pick the snake up by the tail. And the thing I want you to notice from the text is that Moses does what God says. Yeah? Put your hand into your cloak. He does what God says, pull it out. He does what God says, is healed. Now, what I have learnt over the years is that if we will learn to do what God tells us as individuals, and it might be very small things, and as a church, if we do what God tells us to do as a church, God will do the rest. All we've got to do is be obedient to him. Now, I'm going to tell you an extraordinary thing that happened a few years ago. I don't know whether... The trouble is, I can never remember what I've said where. So if I say something twice, just say, I've heard that, Roger. That's okay. So a couple of years... No, probably three or four years ago, a couple of guys came to see me, and they said, uh, Roger, God has told us to make a cage. Did I tell you this? Make a cage... Uh, outside St. Michael the Belfry, and we're, we've been told by God to live in the cage for a whole week and to depend on him for everything. These young guys, very committed Christians, they're involved in one of our congregations in the gymnasium. And uh, so I said, what do you mean? And uh, I mean, how are you going to live? And they said, well, we're, we're to rely on God for all our food and all our drink. And, uh, and I said, well, how are you going to get to the loo and that sort of stuff? And they said, well, we'll have a little tent in the, in, the, in the cage. So I said, sounds pretty weird to me. Let's have a go. So we built a cage for them outside St. Michael of Belfry. And these two chaps uh, went into the cage in sort of orange Guantanamo type suits. And they lived in the cage for the whole week. They slept in the cage and they talked to 4,600 people about Jesus Christ, because people gathered round. Uh, when have I got to finish this session? 
half past, okay. Well, I just want to tell you one amazing story that came out of it. They relied, they had all the food, all the drink that they needed, was look, they were provided for, people looked after them. And there was one day, one of the men who talked to him, talked to them, was a great big chap. He was 25 stone, huge man. And he was a publican. He, he, he built up pubs. He was an atheist. He built up pubs and then he would, what he called, he would press the self-destruct button and then he'd come down and then he'd, things would fall apart and then he'd go and build up another pub. He was very successful at building up pubs. And uh, unfortunately, this had happened just once too often. So the last time it happened, he was over 60 and he ended up, he'd lost his job, he'd been through three marriages, he's in a bit of a state and he ended up, uh, the council put him in a, in a little room in, uh, and then he was walking through past St. Michael of Belfry and he walked past and he saw these two chaps in the cage and he said, I won't say the exact words because they're a bit rude. Uh, he said, what the blankety blank are those blankety blanks doing? We don't need any more bl blankety blanks. We've got enough blankety blanks in York. And he walked past the church and as he walked past the church, a little voice said to him inside, well, why don't you go and talk to these blankety-blanks? Well, I don't think he said that, but why don't you go and talk to them? So he turned round and he went back and he started to talk to them and he found, to his amazement, they were great guys, very warm, interested in him. And they, uh, he asked them what they were doing and they said that God had told them to be in this cage. And they used the cage analogy of, as an example of what Jesus Christ does when he comes... To he was so interested that he went to see them every day and he used to take them food and biscuits and things and he, he was a big chap so he pulled a, would get a stool out of the church and sit and talk to them. At the end of the, and they invited, they got to know him and they invited him to their church. They said we'd love you and he, he liked them so much he said he'd come but he wasn't going to come. He, he just said that because he liked them. Anyway, the, the day came for the, um, for the, for them to come out and the, cameras were there and it was in the newspapers and he went to see them come out of the cage and then he didn't go to the church on the Sunday and they bumped into him just independently York's not a very big place they bumped into him the following week and they both said to him oh we're so sorry you said you were going to come we were so looking forward to you coming and you didn't come and he said he made some excuse and he said he'd moved into a new flat he would just got another flat and they then said, well, we'd like to help you. And they moved him. They moved him. They got a white van and they moved him and all this stuff. This really impressed him. So he decided to go to the church because of that. And he went to the church with them and he loved the singing and he loved the, what was going on. He loved the fellowship. But he could not believe that Jesus Christ could love him because he'd done many, many evil, bad things in his life. And so it might be fine for other people, but this couldn't happen to me. I'm too bad. Lots of people feel that. Loads and loads of people feel that. Anyway, the little boy said to him, well, why don't you go into the other church where the cage was? And he wandered in. I didn't know him at this point. And he stood at the back of the church and in the evening service, there were several hundred people there, and it gets quite, you know, lively, and, and uh, people were raising their hands. He always stood there with his hands in his pockets at the back, all 25 stone of him. And then the words of a chorus came up. I think it was, I, uh, take me as I am, I can come no other way. And in that moment, he said it was like a, a light shone that's how he described it to me later, onto him, and he suddenly realized that Jesus Christ had died for him. And not only had he died for him, but he'd forgiven him. He couldn't believe this. And then he, it suddenly dawned on him that he'd been forgiven by Jesus, and his hands shot out of his pocket, and he lifted them up to thank God. And he turned around and there was a man sitting next to him, very kind man, who leant across and he put his hand on Jim's shoulder and he said, I've got work for you to do. 
he carried on singing and he turned and the chap had vanished. Anyway, he decided, as a result of this, to go to the early morning prayer meeting the next day, on the Tuesday. I was leading the early morning. I didn't know this, any of this. Seven o'clock, we, er- we have an early morning prayer meeting from seven till eight, and I'm leading this meeting. There are about 30 people there, and we're all sitting on little collapsible plastic chairs you know those very sort of thin ones that's and uh, this great huge man waddles in into the middle of the prayer meeting and comes in and then sits on one of the plastic chairs in the front row and then the, the, the thing that I've never seen happen happened you guess what's happened his weight broke the chair and this great big fella is lying on the floor and I just don't know what to do. I, you know, it's very difficult to know what to do in a situation like that. Do I say, are you okay down there? Or uh, that was quite an entrance you made? Or, and I decided to carry on and somebody, as if nothing had happened, because I thought it was better if we just carry on, and somebody ran and they got him a uh, a, ch- a wooden chair, like one of these, and he plonked himself in the wooden chair, and I then smiled at him. I said, well, that, that was quite an entrance, wasn't it? And he roared with laughter, and I thought, great, he's got a great sense of humor, this chap. And then I got to know him, and he told me this story that I've just told you. I was amazed. So I was going down to London the following week to do a mission in a church in Shepherd's Bush, St. Simon's. And I said to him, would you come with me? I'm going to take a team down with me. Would you come with me and share your story? So we all meet up at York. We're all absolutely terrified what we're we're going to do on this. The most terrified is this chap. He's only been a Christian about a week or two weeks or something. And we go down on the train and he's so big. You know, there are two chairs and sort of he was in one and a half. So I was kind of, you know very tight, and, the, and then I got him talking, and the people all around were just absolutely, they're all drinking and uh, uh, listening to this story. When we get to London, we meet up with the vicar and have a dinner before the mission is due to start, and there's a lady in the congregation who has got a gift of prophecy, very quiet lady, and she'd been praying for us. Now, we had sent down photographs of our head but they don't so all they had was mug shots they didn't know what happened to us underneath so they didn't know what we were like but they didn't know that Jim was like that so she gives me a word and the word she gives to me is be bold and be strong God is with you great word for me just what I needed because I often feel pretty nervous on these missions even though I've been doing them for 40 years I always get nervous The word she had for Jim was, it's not over until the fat lady sings. (laughs) She gave it to him. She said, I don't know what this means. She gave it to him. He roars with laughter and she says, are you laughing at me? And he said, no, I'm not. He said, I'm amazed that you'd give me that because he said, in the last pub I ran, this was a big pub in New York, they could not get the people out of the pub at night. They'd have 80, 90 people, they couldn't get them. And he used to have, they used to have what were called medieval banquets. And he, ha- he didn't call them his waitresses, he called them his wenches, you know, as a sort of part of the thing. And there was one of them, she was a lady called Barbara, and she was big in every way. She was a very big lady. And she said to Jim, are you having problems getting them out of the pub. He said, yes. She said, give me the microphone. (laughs) So they used to give her the microphone, and she was such a terrible singer. (laughs) The pub would clear within five minutes, everybody would go. So they used to say, it's a Morecambe and Wise line, apparently, it's not over till the fat lady sings. They give Barbara the microphone, and out they'd all go. Now, do you know, on that mission, God used that man so powerfully because he shared of what Jesus had done for him. And on the final day, we didn't have a guest service, 
we had a we had a big breakfast and we invited all of the parish to come and eat breakfast with us in the church we had croissants we had a jazz band we had bacon sandwiches and the lord had said to me as i was preparing my message it's not over until the fat lady sings so i got jim up to speak after i gave my talk then i said i want to introduce you to a friend of mine he gave his so it's very very nervous loads of them came to christ that morning so i'm just telling you do what god tells you that's the key now the second thing and i've nearly finished the second problem was what i'm no good at public speaking inadequacy he felt inadequate for the task and uh, how does god answer him he answers him by saying i made you like that and he gives him someone to help him he sends his brother aaron who's a good speaker and the thing i want you to notice and this is so profound but it's so important is that moses became a great preacher in fact josephus says that he was the greatest of all preachers in the old testament and stephen in the speech in acts when he's describing before he's martyred he describes Moses as a man who was mighty in deed and in word. When I was a young man, one of the greatest preachers in England was an Anglican vicar who had a stutter. And he became, despite this stutter, a wonderful preacher. He was greatly anointed by God. And I was... Um, using i didn't mention his name i was using him as an example when i went to prepare st stephen st simon shepherd's bush for the mission and a young man who was sitting in the was a gathering like this he was he produced films for channel four he came up to me and he said what's the name of the person and he mentioned the name i said yes and he said he's my father and he said what you said is absolutely true. Now, the reason I mention that is that God can use your weakness, not your strength. If you'll give him your weakness, he can turn your weakness into the source of your greatest strength. And that is a gospel principle. God works through human weakness not through human power can you think of the, there are many examples think of paul do you remember paul asked god three times to remove his thorn in his flesh now we don't know what the thorn in the flesh was and god said to him my grace paul is made sufficient in your weakness and Sisters and brothers, we have to learn to bring our weaknesses to God, not our strengths. Actually, where we're strong, that's where we're most dangerous, because that's where we rely on ourselves. It's in our weakness that we need God. And if you can bring your weakness and your vulnerability to God and give it to him, that can become the greatest strength you have. Now, I'd love to say a lot more about this because it's, it's a really important biblical principle. Power through weakness, not through strength. And the last thing, and I just finish with this as we, as we draw this to a conclusion, is when Moses says, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm just not available to you. You'll have to use someone else. And that is the one excuse which made God angry. Now, why did that make God angry? I, I want to suggest that the reason that made God angry, because that is the only thing that ultimately ties the hands of God when we're not available to him. So you don't have to be full of power and full of great strength and confidence. Actually, God's not looking for people like that. He's looking for weak people. 
people like you and me because we are weak aren't we we're weak in lots of ways we have a weak message Christ on a cross we're weak we're not most of us are not fabulously successful or wealthy or gifted most of us are pretty ordinary so he's looking for weak people with a weak message and he'll use them he'll use us he'll use you if God can use me he can use anyone but the key is to be available to him so I want to ask you and I want to challenge you as a church this is the big weekend we've got a big year coming I want to just challenge you all very from the Bible are you available to him don't worry about your unbelief that's no problem to God he can deal with that as long as you obey him and don't worry about your inadequacy we're not good at this or we're not good at that that's no problem to him give him your weakness give him your inadequacy the thing to worry about and the thing that will make him angry is if you say I'm sorry God you'll have to use somebody else I'm not prepared to do this yeah so final thing if you can remember this next slide what God looks for I don't know where I got this but I thought this is good stuff what God looks for is not our ability but our availability he's not really interested in your ability because he doesn't need your ability to reach Shipley he can do it what he wants from you and from me is your availability are you available to him for him to use because if you are he'll use you now it will be hard it's not easy this stuff you've only got to read the book of Exodus not this is not for softies this is tough stuff it's for raw Marines it's not um, easy stuff but if you'll come to him in your weakness and your struggles with belief and you say I'm available he'll use you he will he will because he's a great God let's pray Lord thank you that you used Moses in a wonderful way despite his weakness despite his unbelief you used him because you're a great God and thank you Lord that you can use each one of us in this room despite our weakness despite our unbelief that's no problem to you help us Lord to be available to you help us as a church to be available to you help us as home groups as youth workers as people at places of work people in our street people in our neighborhood Lord help us to be available to you we pray in Jesus name Amen so I think we've got coffee now